Greetings, astronauts, and welcome back to Astro Candy. Hello, I'm your host, Raven, and I'm excited to welcome best selling author, blogger, and magical mixologist Julia Helena Haddis to the show to discuss magical mixology and lunar libations. But before we get into that, I want to say first, Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Astro Candy podcast. We just hit 14,000 downloads, which just makes me so fucking giddy. So if you've ever listened to just one of these episodes, know that one of those downloads is representative of you. And I just appreciate you so freaking much. And I also appreciate you if you've ever rated this podcast or reviewed it. It really helps the visibility. I know I say that like every episode, but I cannot emphasize enough that The reason I host this podcast is to reach as many people as possible because I really think that we talk about some really informative, helpful topics, especially when you're navigating life and love and relationships and career and, you know, life gets hard. But I always want to be a safe space that people can kind of come and listen and learn. So, yeah, it just means a lot to me if you help the show grow by giving it a review on Apple or Spotify. And just so you know, this is the last regular episode ahead of our summer hiatus. So we're currently in season four. We've done 22 episodes of season four so far. Crazy. And it's been wonderful and amazing and fabulous. But I'm kind of getting to the point where I need a little bit of a break just to recenter, regroup. I'm going through a few things in my own life. I'm going to be moving in July. So I have loose ends to wrap up and just like getting myself adjusted. I've got voiceover to focus on because this is not my only job. This isn't even a job. This is more of a hobby because I do not get paid. But um, anyway, I guess I say all this to say that weekly episodes will be no more until September. However, during every astrological season this summer, so that's Cancer, Leo and Virgo, I will be releasing a stargazing episode and then you'll also receive a corresponding newsletter with like a Leo season gift guide, a Cancer season gift card guide, Virgo gift guide, so on and so forth. So I won't be totally dark, but I do plan on just taking a good old fashioned break. All right. Now that we've got the housekeeping done, let's talk about this episode with Julia. It's so good. Let me tell you, first of all, Julia is a longtime practicing witch an energy worker, and an avid craft cocktail fanatic and bartender. She's also a best-selling author, and that's kind of why I had her on this podcast to talk about some of her books. So in this episode, Julia explains how her dream of becoming a fantasy author led her to creative writing and magic and witchcraft. She describes her experience working at a metaphysical shop, the people that she met while she was there, the lessons the knowledge she learned, as well as her career as a bartender. She tells us about how she uses her bartending skills to create potion-like cocktails, which she shares on her blog. Uh, Julia explains how she landed a book deal. So if you're an aspiring author, she gives tips to aspiring authors and writers on navigating the publishing industry and becoming an author. Julia discusses her second book, Moon Magic Mixology, and explains the connection between alcohol and the moon and spirituality before she gives us a brief history of lunar libations and mixology. This is where it really gets good. I mean, Julia's whole story is absolutely incredible, but just like understanding the divine interconnectivity between alcohol and the moon and magic is really exciting. Julia talks about the ritualistic act of drink creation from squeezing and muddling to shaking and stirring, as well as the symbolism of mixology tools and glassware, like your cup means something. We discuss the perfect magical cocktail from Moon Magic Mixology that correlates with the upcoming new moon in Gemini on June 6th, as well as the tens of dozens of other cocktail recipes that are featured in that book and that also pair well with other moon phases. This was such a fun conversation, really lighthearted, and just uh, a great time. Also, you must get one of Julia's books and whip up one of the cocktails. I'm almost completely recovered from my strep throat, and I will start drinking once I do and make one of these cocktails. But until then, enjoy the episode. Julia, welcome to the Astro Candy Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and that we finally can make it work after (laughs) everything. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. So a little backstory. You were going through the throes of it after your most recent book was published. And you're like, Hey, just, so you know, like I'm decompressing. I was like, no worries. This was back in like, when did I reach out to you? Oh April, my God. Maybe? I think put the email. I had it right here. <laughs> Um, yeah, March, March, March. like right around Mercury <laughs> retrograde. We had like the eclipse season and then Mercury retrograde started. Week, oh, so yeah. I'm going to just blame it on that. <laughs> that's what I do too. Like, I'm always like, what's going on in the stars? That's why my life is a mess. <laughs> yeah. But I'm happy we were finally able to get together. I always think divine timing, you know, like I never want to push for things if it's just not working out because I'm like, there's always some other reason, something's going on. So I just like the universe to do its thing. But regardless, I'm happy we have a chance to sit down and chat now. Before we get into everything, like, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where in the world are you? And I also want to ask your sun, moon and rising if if you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm currently located in Arizona, but I'm originally from the Bay Area. So that okay. combined with being um, a bartender and all that, I, I can swear like a sailor. So just want to make sure that is like, <laughs> you can swearing swear. Okay. okay, okay. I just, <laughs> yeah. I never know. My mom is like the exact opposite of me and gets offended whenever I swear. So like I try and be conscious. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, this yeah. this podcast is explicit. Like, yeah, okay. It's marked as explicit. Awesome. So. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I'm from a bit from the Bay Area, which I think probably will become relevant. I'm sure we'll we'll get into it. But like, I worked a little metaphysical in the Bay Area, and then coming into the craft cocktail sphere in the Bay Area because that was one of like the key places where that movement was really happening. It's kind of like how I came to be. But then you know the pandemic and the Bay Area is uh, mm. too expensive. <laughs> Yeah, I could imagine. I mean, it's already expensive. And then, you know, yes, it hits the fan yeah. and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. So I moved to Arizona and then met my partner. And so I'm sticking here through the heat Love because it. of him. But yeah. Would um, you ever come then, back to California? You know, I don't know about to California, but I definitely like to move somewhere more temperate. My key kind of family, they're all kind of, I feel like everyone's moving away from the Bay Area for the most part. Like it's my home, you know, but like my dad just died this last year. My oh, mom and I'm stepdad so are going to be moving. Yeah. And so it's just like, you know, there's really just, I'd rather move somewhere where you're not so affected by the drought all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe more rain. So uh, probably not to the Bay Area, but some, somewhere Can else. I recommend the Midwest? I don't know if you've okay. ever been to the Midwest. A lot of people haven't. They're like, oh, fly over USA. No, it is the best place in the entire world. It's gorgeous in the summertime. I lived in, well, I lived in Ohio and Indiana and Minnesota, but Minnesota was the best. So maybe Ooh. just like if you ever want to go visit like Milwaukee yeah. or Minnesota, Minneapolis, do it in the I summer because the winters are cold, but yeah. it's amazing <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have to check that out. Another thing is also like healthcare. I'm like, what state has a better healthcare program? Good luck. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know for real. It's sad, but yeah. <laughs> so, oh, and yeah, your sun, oh, your sun, moon, and rising. Yeah. Yes. So I am an Aquarius rising, a Leo sun, and a Pisces moon. So, okay. Yeah. Wow. Aquarius rising. I'm an Aquarius sun and an Aquarius okay. moon. So I, I love it. I get that. And also I feel like it like makes sense, like very like whimsical and free spirited yes. and like I'm getting those vibes from you. And then you said, what was a Leo? Leo sun. Mm -hmm. Leo sun. Okay. Love it. And moon was Pisces. Pisces. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's always impressive to me when people have like a rounded big three, you know, you've got the water, air and fire yeah. kind of balances things out. How does that show up for you on a day to day, like your your moon sign and your rising yeah. and sun all coexisting. First of all, I just have to say before I even get into that, I'm like, I'm already just loving your vibe and your energy. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is great. This is like kind of conversation I like to have. But yeah, um, I think for like the Leo Sun, um, if it wasn't for my Leo Sun, I'd probably be more water, just like in terms of my overall chart mm -hmm. and the strength of those positions. Water is probably just a little bit more my strongest element, like just across the the planets and all of that. But um, uh, so if it wasn't for that Leo sun, I would definitely be a little more, you know, on the water side, but like for the Leo sun for me, like I used to be a lead singer in a cover band, a rock cover band, you know? And so it's just like, I think that Leo Amazing. sun, yeah, gives that capacity to like, you can switch, turn on and perform. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm grateful to have like that warm heart to heart, you know, connection with people, but more so like, you know, the Aquarius rising in me hates labels. Like I just yeah. I don't like being put in a box. <laughs> 
you know, and I can connect with a wide variety of people. And I love also just the symbolism of the water bearer, you know, of like that pours the cup. And here I am like literally, you know, start because I started doing this in 2017 as far as the magical mixology stuff. And I'm like yeah. literally sharing magical beverages. Amazing. Um, and yeah. And the Pisces moon for me really comes through of like, you know, my whole journey um, with witchcraft and doing a bunch of energy work and just really having an empathic connection with people and turning in, tuning into that, you know, spirituality. Uh, so that's how it kind of all shows up, just like a mix of, of all these. And I do appreciate the balance between how they all operate, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful astrological cocktail. So I am inspired, yeah. <laughs> especially because it seems like you've been able to take all of these things that you seem very passionate about and make yeah. them into this one thing. So I kind of want to break this down because yeah. I don't even know if you did this consciously or if this was like a flow state and you kind of happened upon all of this and it all worked. But what came first? So obviously you write and obviously you're a mixologist and obviously you're into witchcraft, astrology, magic. So which one of those came first? Yeah. So, um, one thing for sure was, it was writing. Um, but I will okay. say I was always looking for witchcraft and spirituality, but growing up, like my family's from Poland and Poland's very Catholic. Um, and I have dual citizenship. So I wasn't actually aware of people practicing, you know, witchcraft or paganism or alternative spiritualities. I was only really exposed to, you know, Christianity and you know, big three or whatever, but I was always kind of looking for it, you know, and it was just like the weird thing. Like I look back, like when I was a little kid, like when I studied, um, you know, ancient Egyptian mythology, I created my own like altar. I scared the shit out of my mom. I created like an altar in my closet, you know, <laughs> to, um, and I was love it. With, yeah, the cat deity Bast. And, you know, so I was always like drawn and like looking to those things, but writing came first and because I wanted to be like a fantasy writer and Ooh. I thought I was, yeah. And I wanted to be an author originally, but was getting more into creative writing. And then um, probably what would explain the rest of it is then when I finally did find, oh, like people practice these kinds of things. There are people who practice magic. This isn't just something, you know, I've been looking for it my mm -hmm. whole life, right? And I think a lot of people can kind of relate to that. We all have that story. And so when I found, you know, witchcraft and alternative spirituality, metaphysics, um, I started going to a local metaphysical shop and just consistently took classes there in, as a teenager and started working behind the counter too as a sales associate. Um, and so I will say like that place kind of like merged all of these really unique things together because the three owners of that store were a different um paths in life so you had uh, and they're all they're all now authors too and amazing authors in their own right and so you have like Chaz Bogan who was you know trained in hoodoo and conjure and so he would do the blends for the shop the mixture of herbs and oils to dress candles and so you know he would have us mixing up the herbs to put into these batches um it's, you know, to help people with their spell work. So we'd be helping them with um, spell suggestions. And then you have like Devin, who came from a Wicca background and like did crystal magic and all these wonderful things. Um, he does modern witch. He's great. I love him. And I'm going to be collaborating with him some stuff soon. And then you have like Storm, who I learned Reiki from and is part of the fairy tradition. And so they're all like, and then we also had an in-house astrologer, Paul Bogle, um, who I learned a lot from. So just being in that environment, I really kind of like just was exposed to all of those mm -hmm. things at one time. They weren't separated. It wasn't one thing over another. Um, and so it's kind of like the funny thing is like, through some of my books, you'll see like I have the Modern Witchcraft Book of Astrology and then now also the Moon Magic one. It's just like hard for me to like separate all of the things because to me they're like astrology, you know, uh, you know, crystals, witchcraft, the moon, all of it was just always all together. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I became this weird blend of all of these different things. <laughs> well, that's amazing. It speaks to your Aquarius rising, just not wanting to like put anything in a box. It's like, hello, yeah. it's all fluid. But I feel like you lived my dream of working in a metaphysical shop. Seriously, like I lived in Philly at one point. They were pretty big there, which I don't know why that surprised me. But <laughs> And I would always pass by or go into one and I always gravitate toward them. I think a lot of people do like maybe they don't know anything about it, but they're like, hmm, what's this? There's a curiosity there. And so 
I've always found myself going into whatever. If I see one, I stop to yeah. go in. And they have wonderful books and stuff too. I'm wondering if while you were there, you saw any books that really stood out to you before you ever wrote one of your own. Yeah. I mean, first of all, so while I was there, um, cause I worked there before I was even 21. So this was before I even got into bartending. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I would hope so, so but yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah. And they all were like writing their books at that time. And then also in the shop, um, for a while I would, you know, put out the book list, um, because I would, you know, make book recommendations and also look at what people were ordering. So I was for p- part of it, just kind of like putting together the book list of what they should, should order to restock the shop. But there wasn't really any specific, especially like when it comes to me and, and magical mixology, there was mm-hmm. never a book on that subject. Um, and so that's when I like ironic. And also like, I want to say like working at a metaphysical store it- is definitely like a dream like I miss it every day at the same time I will say it's like because as a bartender you have that side of like dealing with people with who are maybe drinking too much alcohol you get a wide range like being a therapist or whatever all those things but the truth is is like working at a metaphysical shop is even more so that because people always come to a witchcraft shop in various states you get people mm. who just had something traumatic happen that even made them decide to look up a spell to do or like they're dealing with some kind of desire or need and so you get like these kinds of extremes or like someone just died and they you know they want to do a ritual for that so it's very intense and I will say like you you get people too who haven't done the spirit like the inner work like you know even if you're into magic and spirituality you know you still there's still that journey with um the shadow work and looking at that shadow aspect of yourself and some people just don't do that and they kind of come into a metaphysical shop and they're like I feel this energy off of you and just really bad boundaries Ooh. and projecting and so it's kind of like it's 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 something I do love and like miss being in that healing environment and helping people on their spiritual journeys and guiding them and tuning into their intuition but on the the shadow side of that you also get people who project who Mm. don't have great boundaries um and maybe they have some kind of something else they need deeper help that a crystal isn't going to help them so it's my gentle way of putting it there's a lot of crazy stories (laughs) (laughs) I I thought you're gonna say there's a lot of crazy people but probably that too (laughs) that's so interesting I never would have thought about that So I'm kind of happy that you said something. I'm a reflector in human design. So I think that might be my nightmare is just like having people coming at me. And then I'm like equally coming at them because I'm feeling their energy and I'm just like, "Ah!" but um, anyway. And even the readers, like honestly, like there were some some readers who just really bad, like, listen, you got to like be able to understand what is your personal projection and your, your personal side of things and separate that from projecting that onto other people. Like I've come in from parking and someone would be like, you're upset at me. And I'm like, I'm not upset at you. I just fucking parked my car, you know, like in the yeah. Bay area, like if I'm a little stressed, it's from car parking. I'm not upset at, you know, if it was just yeah. kind of like walking on eggshells of like, so that's like one thing that I think as people get into intuitive work, you have to learn to like, look at kind of what your you know, your history and healing history is and learn to separate and still have those good boundaries if it's really not your business, what else someone is thinking or feeling. And can you even really know that? So, yeah, Yeah, definitely. So up until this point, you're like not even 21 yet and you're (laughs) working in the metaphysical shop. So when did you start bartending and then simultaneously infusing this with magic and the moon and witchcraft? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so being in that environment, like a metaphysical shop, people would come in and ask for, what should I do for this moon or this moon, you know, moon rituals and stuff. And so I was already like, you know, sharing information with people on that. I was certified and, and, uh, attuned in Reiki and, um, shamanic energy practices and doing tarot reading. So I moved into that. And then across directly across from us, there was, um, a piercing and tattoo parlor and someone who worked there was like, Oh, I just took like a bartending course. It's great. You should check it out. And so I was kind of like, Oh, that sounds interesting. You know, I'm going to about to transfer to finish college. So, you know, that might be a good way to make money, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. of bartending and tips. And so I kind of set it aside and sometime, sometime during the year when I was 21, after like nine months, I decided to just take the class and 
instantly fell in love because even just in the history of bartending and mixology itself, there's such a story uh, of how the cocktail even came to be. Um, and the craft cocktail movement was really strong at that time. And so the plethora of craft liqueurs, people were working with shrubs, you know, and various bitters. And so there's just so many ways and me coming from my background, I was like, well, if I mix these various herbs, you know, jasmine, chamomile, cinnamon, patchouli, et cetera, in a money blend, um, why can't I put those same ingredients, obviously, as long as they're edible, you know, into a cocktail and have a money potion. And so, um, you know, I started kind of doing my blog or like writing that on the side and just was trying to move up quickly in the bar world. I was excited to learn as much as possible um, and, you know, moved very quickly to working various places, becoming, you know, a manager. Never recommend that. It's the worst. (laughs) Why do you say that? Oh, it's kind of like a joke in the bar, bar world of like, you know, don't ever move up to the position of manager. Cause it's just, you don't get the tips anymore. Mm. And then you have to deal with all of these crazy logistics and, um, you know, so it's like exciting the idea of moving up and then you're finally like, fuck this sucks. You yeah. Know? Cause like, but yeah, it's just, it's a joke in like the, the bar communities and stuff. But yeah, so like moving up my way, being a barley bar manager, worked at a distillery for about a year and a half too. And that's kind of the thing of like we talked about earlier in the Bay Area is so expensive. Like I was working multiple jobs at once. Mm, wow. <laughs> that's probably also part of the reason why I have all these like bizarre, you know, skills or interests is because it's just impossible to have just one job. So mm. for a time, like I was had my my days where I was doing, you know, um, energy work at the shop and then would be bartending and working at the distillery, you know, on, on weekends and nights and stuff. So it was like this, you know, interesting blend of stuff and naturally it seeped over um, where I was like, oh, these, you know, murky retrogrades happening. Let me offer a special at the bar over the weekend, you know, infused with um, lavender and clear quartz for clarity, you know, and doing stuff like that. So yeah. Your bar let you kind of come up with your own cocktails. Yeah. Yeah, I finally, it's like, it's hard to do that. Um, because a lot of places, especially now where you have all this corporatization, you're not allowed oftentimes to make your own recipes, you know, but finally I ended up at like a small local bar who that's kind of like where I moved into a bar lead position. And I was looking at their various alcohol and and working on menu development and stuff with them. And so they just would let me over the weekend do my very specials. And so we, I would bring in a tarot reader from the shop amazing yeah to read tarot and I would do a corresponding cocktail that weekend for for astrological energy or a tarot card or like let's say that one of the sabbats is coming up you know the spring equinox or whatever so yeah but the thing is like no one was interested at that time really uh yeah it was just it was too soon and like I would go to local metaphysical shops and be like I'm doing it you know like if you guys and um you know people would like love the drinks but it's just people weren't going out of the way to find it it just they didn't they weren't in, it wasn't going through a huge growth in the witchcraft and spirituality um, sphere but you know my friend prompted me to like still share my blog and so I kept that up and um when it was time and people were suddenly getting interested in it, uh, my publisher, you know, saw what I was putting out there and uh, that's how it manifested in in the book. So, yeah. Amazing. First of all, thank you for connecting all of those dots. Yeah. (laughs) It's like reading someone's Wikipedia page and you're like, okay, but how did they get there though? Because it's always just like the (laughs) quick hits and you're like, but how did they do it? Yeah. And so I love just the backstory and the color commentary, if you will, about, yeah. you know, metaphysical shops. And but you were always wanted to write fantasy and then you were into cocktail. <laughs> like it all just makes sense. Yeah. And so I appreciate you explaining that. Um, And I also yeah. just am so inspired by really just the fluidity of your story because it just really shows that if you like follow what lights you up yeah um, you can really can make an incredible career out of it or just yeah. do something you really truly love so I appreciate yeah. that about yeah your and I love that you tuned into that because I'm I'm all about that you know just following your passion and I think sometimes especially like when I look at my path it's like 
I didn't know how the fuck this all was going to come together. You know, it was just in my interests and I did my own research and was wanting to share that information because also that information, there wasn't a book on uh, magical mixology then. Right. And so doing my own research and stuff. So it's just, you never really know how everything's going to come together. And it's just when you kind of pursue your various interests at some point in time with the right to divine timing, like yeah. things will come together in a way you didn't quite expect or envision. I love that. I, I, my, my new motto is fuck the how, because yeah. our logical minds, like when we want something say, I want to be an author. The first thing we do is like, well, how, how do I be an author? And it's yeah. like, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Don't think about the how it will come to you. It will come together, but just like do that first thing that you love, which is just writing, start yeah. writing and see where that leads you. So speaking of writing, I know so many people who love to write and your uh, publisher comes to you and is like, Hey, like this would be amazing. I'm looking at your blog. Would you write something up? My question is, was this an easy or difficult process for you? Like when you had the pressure of a publisher kind of being like, hey, we're going to work together a deal and you actually need to write this. Because sometimes there's this thing where it's like, well, if it's fun and there's no sort of attachment and I have my freedom, I can do it. But when there's pressure and maybe like responsibility, then it's like, oh, God, like, can I do it? Obviously, you did it. But I'm just wondering, like, did that affect your process at all? How was that? Yeah, that is a complicated answer for me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the time. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I would say if someone decides they want to be an author, you, you like write for sure, like, like screw the how, like you said, like just get started, but at the same time, do some fucking research because if you don't, you can get screwed. So I do recommend that people get book agents because if you want to be an author and you want to write, do it, you know, pursue it and also just get information and research and treat it seriously. And that was the thing for me is like when I first got into it and when I first started sharing on it in 2017, like I went and saved the domain name. I knew I wanted witchcraft cocktails to be a book, right? But I didn't believe in myself. And so I didn't pursue that at that time. And I wasn't sure it was going to be anything. And because I didn't believe in myself, like I feel like things could have been differently if I had trusted myself a little more and was like, okay, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. And I did start kind of drafting some things, but the thing is, is like, I didn't fully believe in it. And so it wasn't until my publisher came to me and there can be a blessing in waiting for things and the right timing for it to come together at the same time. I was ill-informed about what norms are in the industry. Cause like, you know, when you're writing a book for the first time and you haven't researched it, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and there, and yeah. there's people who are book coaches and stuff. And so that's why I recommend people get a book agent just because that's someone who can like guide you into the mm. process. And just to clarify, like, you know, my, my publisher is great. It's just like when you first, when you don't have that research and that experience, you just don't know what's normal. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's just very common when you're getting into anything yeah. new. It's just like a little bit, first of all, it's like giddy and excited and starry eyed. And then you kind of get whiplash because you're like, oh, shit, like this is actually happening. So I think a lot of people can relate to that. That's incredible advice, though. Coming from someone who has now published three books, I yeah. think anyone listening and I know I, I have a lot of creative friends who do write and are interested in that. So do your damn research. Yeah. It's really all you can do and know what you're getting into just as far as like the industry, the scope and stuff like that. So yeah. yes, without knowing the how exactly it'll all play out, you can still kind of take those steps to ensure that the process can go smooth, yeah. but <laughs> I'm happy that it all worked out for you. And I want to yeah. talk about your three books. So your first one, Witchcraft Cocktails. Mm -hmm. Your second one, Moon Magic Mixology, and your most recent, The Modern Witchcraft Book of Moon Magic. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, I guess you kind of did about the writing process. And I guess I could assume the most challenging part was just writing the first one or were they all in just a two month span? 
Yeah, I didn't get a book agent until I didn't have a book agent except for this last book. So it took me a while. Um, And then also another recommendation is joining the Authors Guild because they have a lot of great webinars and panels. I think they even have like free recordings on their website. So you don't even need to join them. And that's where I kind of started to learn about industry norms. And I was like, okay, like I clearly need someone who's more informed than me. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so they they were all pretty much the same timeline. Um, and, And the thing is like, that's part of the trouble with the two month deadline is like, I'm going to be just frank when you're writing a book that quickly, unless you have most of it pre-written, um, you kind of just have to take a, a sabbatical from whatever job you yeah, have. No kidding. Um, so that's, it was like a definitely hard to like keep up, um, especially because what I do is, is taste testing, right? So when it comes to the cocktails, you know, I can have all these grand ideas and the same thing with like spells, you know, you can put, to, you know, how to do various spells and put together rituals and stuff. But the difference is with cocktails is you have to actually make sure it tastes good. And you have to make sure it also adheres to other people's palates. So that was kind of the challenging, I think, with writing a mixology book is like, mm. you know, it, it, from what I do, it has to have a lot of nuance and meaning to it. But it also needs to taste good. So that's kind of the, the challenging with the timeline on that, you know, is because sometimes people, it's hard to, I've had like people come over and do taste testings, but it's like when you're pressing out that many drinks at one time, yeah. like people don't want to leave hammered, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so like, okay, True. I have had like, I have had two, like seven drinks is enough. Like these are all different flavor profiles entirely because each drink needs to be different. Um, so it's definitely challenging when you're doing drink recipes that are, you know, unique and and meaningful and then have all these different flavors. Um, so what was your question? Did I answer it? You did answer it. (laughs) Yeah. So, okay. I want to talk about moon magic mixology primarily. And Julia at the end of this will tell us how we can get any of her books, but this one, I think really significant. I mean, not that they all aren't, but I think more recently, especially in pop culture, a lot of people have started manifesting with the moon and they're more attuned to the moon and its phases now more than ever. And this is just something that ties in cocktail infusions, potions with the phases of the moon, which again is just so incredible. So you detail in this specifically the connection between the moon and alcohol. And you give like a brief history and stuff and like how it's intertwined. Can you just like a little bit go into that for people? Yeah. How- and also just talking on the book writing subject, because I had already written witchcraft cocktails. I was like, okay, I know that I want to pack as much info in here as possible. So unfortunately I feel so bad for my publisher because they're such wonderful people. And I just like, I, I stuffed a lot of writing. Like my last three books, we had to cut out a lot of words. So wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Like my, my moon magic book that we just, that just came out, we had to take out 10,000 words. Cause I just, I, I like to make things accessible and like to put in a lot of information, but also sometimes it's just not realistic. And so this one I definitely stuffed, but as far as like, just even the, the talking about mixology and its connections to ancient healing and, and witchcraft and spirituality practices, I think oftentimes in ancient cultures, all of these things were tied together. They weren't as separate as they're seen to be today. And so like when it comes to bitters or even shrubs, so shrubs mix- drinking vinegars that are like mixed, you know, with sugar and, you know, those were to preserve fruits and ingredients and bitters were specifically, you know, tinctures that were created for like stomach maladies and healing. And even further back, the creation of alcohol, fermentation and distillations tied to a lot of ancient religious and spiritual practices. And every culture kind of had their own fermentation that they would do. They would see the practice as sacred. So we can look to ancient Sumeria. You had the beer goddess Ninkasi who had her own, you know, hymn that they would, uh, her hymn. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. How do we say it? Wait, what, 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 wait, what are you trying to say? Basically there was like a prayer that they would like sing or say sometimes I, because of my Slavic background and also like, I tend to read and not talk a lot. So I was trying to say like, you're okay. It's like him or hymn. It's like, I just thought of the band when you said that. Oh, oh, the That's Heim. Oh like, my God. Yeah, I was like, they're great wait, wait. though. I love their, yeah. <laughs> so good, so good. <laughs> um, yeah, so they basically have this, you know. Oh, him. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So th- <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> I'm like embarrassed myself. There was You're some fine. word the other day that I was like, oh my God, I have been mispronouncing this like on, on podcast and interview for the last five years. I just, oh I can God. never. Do you remember what it is? No, of course, now that I, the ADHD, you know, brain, like I, I was like, it was bothering me the other night. And I was like, I can't believe anyone, no one has ever said anything. 
I'll try. Hopefully I remember by the end of the podcast, but <laughs> before it was, but this happens all the time for me. So yeah. Um, you know, and so she was believed this the beer goddess was believed to be in every drop of beer and oversee the process. You know, you have in um, ancient um, South and Central Mexico, you know, you have polke and the fermentation of the agave plant and, you know, how the, that was connected to various, you know, mayahuel. And so fermentation was deeply spiritual and these specific plants were tied to, you know, deities and these fermented beverages were drunk to connect to deities, right? So in the case of like ancient Sumeria, beer would be drunk to connect to, to deities and things like that. And I, I put a lot of that into the book of like talking about different cultures and how these beverages were sacred. And I don't think it's that much of a stretch to make because I know a lot of us are very conscious of Christianity or at least in Catholicism, right? Like you drink wine, right? And that's supposed to be the blood of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like, you you know, there's always been this connection between spirituality, even um, green chartreuse, right? That's still made by monks up in the French Alps. So a lot of these alcoholic beverages come from spiritual backgrounds. They're a way to, we're a way to connect to deities um, and and also preserve herbal remedies. and so it's been an interesting journey of how those things have all combined to modern mixology today, where you have mm-hmm. those bitters that are interesting flavors, but they also hold on to the, the energy of the plants. And even in herbalism, you have tinctures, right? So the way that bitters are tinctures, depending on, you know, obviously where you get your bitters from, or if you make them yourself, um, to attune to spiritual and, and herbal remedies. So yeah, and obviously I do want to preface this, like I'm a firm believer in making things non-alcoholic too, to be accessible to everyone. So it's not like everything in moderation, right? So even these ancient cultures had rules and regulations around drinking alcohol, oftentimes public drunkenness was outlawed, they'd be drunk specifically you know, for, for ritual purposes or on celebration days, or there'd be like certain types of people who had excuses to be able to, to drink all the time. <laughs> There's like some, I, I maybe I shouldn't talk about because I'm not, but there's like, I know when it comes to pulque, there's like people born under certain energy that were just like believed to be destined to just be drunk all the time. <laughs> what? Should, yeah, yeah, I have, I'm so, I'm like, I read and write and research a lot of things. And then if I haven't refreshed my mind on it, I forget it. So I have to look up specifically what I'm talking about but yeah they're just like all of these interesting rules and regulation but basically overall all ancient cultures you know it's not like they were just saying drink all the time right it was sacred it was sharing beverage with people a form of connection connecting to deities or celebrating connecting with your you know fellow human um and so yeah I'm a big proponent of also non-alcoholic versions because what I do is I'm combining the meaning or biology the folklore and also you know looking at the herbalistic properties of various ingredients so like grapefruit right grapefruit's really great for boosting your mood it's associated with positivity and also just associated with cleansing right and so being intentional about the ingredients you're putting into what it is that you drink whether it's like lavender for peace right yeah so that's I've, I'm forgetting what your question was again. I just totally no, went off on a tangent. You're you're fine, and the <laughs> tangent inspired more questions, okay. so that's always good. Yeah. Um, I have a couple. First, I want to ask: Do you think that this is at the forefront of mixology today, or have most mixologists forgotten, like why they use certain bitters or why they're using certain flavors? Yeah, I think that some people are aware of this history, but it's not very prevalent. I think there's been a revival. Um, so like I said, the time that I was posting about this online in 2017, people weren't really like interested in it. Um, but then, you know, interest has happened and now like, you know, there's some distilleries popping up and I'm just going to be honest, like in terms of like witchcraft, and this is just more from a publishing perspective, alternative spiritualities like witchcraft are kind of like they had a really trending moment after during and after the pandemic and now they're kind of going downhill like it's it's not super main like it's not going to be mainstream all the time and so I think some bartenders who are really interested in craft history you know probably know that the history of bitters right it came from this surgeon general in an army and like oh my god 1800s 1700s I can't remember exactly when but like who create a tincture to help with, you know, stomach maladies and for the Angostura bitter specifically, right? And so some might know that, but not everyone, um, because the average bartender is just getting paid, you know, minimum wage plus tips to serve you a drink. So they're not yeah. like <laughs> Yeah, no, that's you that, know? that I get it. 
You know, we yeah. all got to make our dollar. Then the other question I had is like, how much research did you do for this? Because I was reading the beginning of this and I'm just like, this is so many facts yeah. and I, which is wonderful because we need facts. But I do wonder how long your research process was before you were really able to like sit down and flesh it all out. Yeah, research is really important to me from a multitude of layers. Um, on one hand, when I first got into witchcraft, um, it, it wasn't, you know, mainstream. And so I was just like, finding a couple of really old ass ancient books from the public library that were like, so old and so out of date. And like, I was trying to learn from that. And I think this is the day and still like where there were really weird online forums, you know, like clearly yeah. before Reddit and shit. Um, and so like the only way that I could like beyond just going to the metaphysical shop and taking classes, I was like going on these online forums. And so like one problem that I really encountered at the time, because there wasn't a lot of resources or a lot of mainstream stuff, um, or maybe it wasn't necessarily safe to be out and about about your alternative spiritual practices. It's I found and encountered a couple of books that like would put their personal gnosis, low personal gnosis is like a lot of times in witchcraft or spirituality, you know, you connect with a deity or a type of energy and you, you come to your own belief and experience with that, but your own belief and experience, while it can be informative and helpful and you can share that with others, you need to preface that as being your personal experience and not necessarily a fact right mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so like i would encounter in some of these old ass you know wicca i didn't become wiccan but i still like research that wicca books of like they're putting their personal gnosis and personal experiences in these books that weren't actually based in any reason or fact. So example, cat goddess fast, right? I've been working with her since I was in sixth grade because I studied, in, you know, when we studied ancient Egyptian mythology and I was like, oh my God, I am a fucking cat person. You know, a, a lot of cool stuff happened with that and like how I interact with cats from then on. But like, I went and read a book and they're like, oh, Bast is a panther. And I'm like, what? what the fuck are you on about? Like, she's from in fucking Egypt, you know? And so, like, they didn't even, like, have panthers, you know, mm. like, black panthers there, you know? And so they had put that in the book. And so it became really frustrating for me because, like, the, it's one thing if she had said, that author had said, I don't even know what book it is. So, but it's just, like, if they had said, like, you know, in my personal experience and working with her, she's come across to me this way, right? Mm -hmm. There's one way of saying that versus there's one way of saying, like, let's historically, we need to honor the origins of all of our practices and beliefs, right? And so I think that's a lot of thing that we get into trouble with, you know, in our Western alternative spiritual practices is taking things from other cultures that out that contest context yeah. and understanding and also just making sure that with, with the permission right because I think a lot of cultures do like to share but you cannot just separate and like take something and then not have that that context of that background where it comes from so on that level for me is like a professional witch who was like going through all of these things and really interested in historical stuff it's important to me to have research for that reason, but also I have a degree in anthropology and this is like, while well, I was bartending is when I completed that degree. And so anthropology, you know, the study of human culture, right. Um, you know, cross-cultural studies, uh, physical anthropology, all those different things and studying mythology. So those things are really important to me. So I like to make sure that I'm not just pulling shit out of my ass. Like there's a background. So I like to do a lot of history because it is there. And so that's part of the reason why, like, I don't meet my deadlines <laughs> when it comes to two months is because I'm like, I want to put all this is important to me to like, you know, for people to understand the background of things. Because I feel like what we drink today to make those things more meaningful, if you can understand the background of that. And so this has always been spiritual. We've just become detached. Alcohol has been, you know, used. And, and when you become connected to the meaning and the spirituality of those beverages and understand that history what mm. you drink today becomes more meaningful becomes sacred it's a way to connect to your ancestors you know or you know to connect energetically to these themes um so yeah well i think you perfectly sum it all up in your book as far as the history it's very comprehensive i think sometimes that can be a tune out right like if it's yeah. just too much information but I feel like you very clearly and concisely like laid out what the reader needs to know, why it's important. And that gives that context that you're talking about for, you know, the rest of the book, which is why we're using 
these certain ingredients, yeah. these certain flavors. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's amazing. So going back to the book, you mentioned that even something like, you know, gathering your ingredients and mixing and pouring to create this cocktail can be part of the magic. And I really yeah. like this. I have my own kind of take on it, but I would love to know yours, like why, why it's so important. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Obviously, it's it's the ingredients and the correspondences and also just, I think as you kind of mentioned earlier, but also just the moon's connection to the ingredients, right? The moon and uh, that's something I get into more in my m- most recent book, although that's purely like a spell book and moon magic and doesn't have a lot of drink recipes. Um, but, you know, the moon is connected to all of us. It's It helps experience or helps our experience of the seasons, right? Our seasons would be a lot faster, the uh, hours in a day would be much less without the relationship that we have with the moon. So it kind of, and also the, the water cycles, right? And the tides and all of that is a big part of human evolution, the evolution of life on earth. And so when you think of everything's kind of connected to the moon in that way, but also, you know, beyond just that connection, corresponding your ingredients. And I think on two levels, just from like an alternative spirituality perspective of just being conscious of every facet of the drink, right? So you can be conscious of when you're um, stirring your drink, right? If you're doing it clockwise to bring in, counterclockwise to cleanse, when you're squeezing your citrus juice, you know, thinking of of uplifting and cleansing away any negative energy, Mm -hmm. um, when you're muddling, you know, to to break down barriers to your goals or break down energy or infuse, there's just so many different ways you can take. I'm very kinesthetic, as you can probably see with my... (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know we're just shaking be the act of shaking with ice raising energy you know when you think of like drumming or rattling or sound it can also be you know just beyond the movement aspect which is magic and raising energy in itself the rhythm of the sound the ice ice and being water and how water holds on to energy right so making moon water ice cubes or even the water and the alcohol because all alcohol has a water content what is the base ingredient of each alcohol that you're using, right? So for example, you know, when it comes to whiskeys and grains and what are the symbols of grains, um, the symbolism of, you know, abundance, but also grounding the seeds of the past that bring the seeds of, that are the seeds of the future. Um, But yeah, anyway, and also just the symbolism, I think of like the cup, like to me, that's a big thing of like with the connection with water and the imagery of the chalice and a cup being a container is a symbolism for the blessings you allow in your life, how you nurture and sustain your body. And so even the symbolism of pouring your cup, uh, that connection of what am I allowing into my life? How am I nurturing myself? Mm -hmm. You know, what blessings am I bringing in? Um, and what am I tuning? What am I choosing to hold? Right. Um, so I, I like that. tuning into that metaphor too. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a mixologist, but I did recently switch to hand making matcha, like the very Ooh, like yes. Wait, whole what? process of it. Yeah. Well, okay, Wait, like, what? not the matcha leaves, like not the, oh. or, not the <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I mean, I like, like, Wait, you know how you can like, you know, most people go to Starbucks and get it. Or you can take it and use the frother and and just pour some. But I have taken the Japanese set of making matcha tea and using the bamboo whisk and (sighs) doing all of this, making the hot water in a tea kettle, pouring it in. Okay, so just what I mean by that is the grounding presence of this ritualistic experience. Like I said, I'm not a mixologist, but I can only imagine it's the same type of energy where you're it's just like, thing. yeah, you're dropping in, you're present, you're, you are expressing gratitude for the ingredients and what you're about to nourish your body yes. with, put into your body. Yeah. So yes. I really loved that when you were just specifically talking about how it's the, it's the whole process that's magic. Yeah. Like it's not just the drink or, you know, the potion or the spell that you yeah. do. It's really just this whole full body, full sensory experience. So yeah. I loved that. Yeah. I wanted to say, cause I'm totally a matcha host. I think you probably saw, I got excited. Like when yeah, you, you were did. like, I, I I'm like, not oh. that probably advanced, but <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, wait, what? I'm like, do you like have like tea leaves? Like I wish, are- <laughs> I wish I'm not there I'm yet. Like, okay. <laughs> but no, I love that because like, I don't know, like with, I'm not like a super big Starbucks person, but 
I was meeting with an author, another local author recently, and like that Starbucks had just came out their matcha with like lavender mm-hmm. syrup. And I was like, I don't want to go every day to buy this. Let me figure out how to make this at home. And I'm just like so fucking in love with it. But yeah, like especially matcha, like that's like so, you know, earthy. And like I yeah. have my own lavender syrup now that I add to it and just almond milk, like really simple because who has the time to do a whole thing? But like, wait, can you drop your lavender syrup? Yeah, you know, I'll totally just say it right now. So part of it is, is like two teaspoons of matcha. Okay. But you know, some matchas you need to do a whole uh, tablespoon, two teaspoons of matcha. Then I do um, a, a quarter cup, right, of hot water. And so I use the, the I have just a, a frother. Um, now I'm like jealous and I'm like, I need to figure out what this Japanese need a bamboo, ritual is. A bamboo <laughs> yeah. um, I add a quarter cup to a third cup of, of lavender simple syrup. So taking a little bit of lavender, equal parts hot water to sugar and measure it separately. You just steep it like a lavender tea okay. and then you add equal amount. And so I pre-make that. And so I have the matcha, the hot water, and then I add my lavender simple syrup, one fourth cup to one third cup, and then about like 10 ounces of, of almond milk. So it's actually probably enough drinks for two people, but like I just gulp it down. But probably better than almond milk is oat milk, but um, the thing is just oat milk has more calories. So it's super basic. Like this isn't fancy at all, but like I was trying to play around with like coconut milk and adding butterfly pea flour to get the color, but then when you mix it with the green, like that's one thing is people make these really aesthetic photos and you can see that layering and it looks so beautiful. But when you drink, you want it all mixed together. Yeah. And when you have that blue like mixed with the green, it kind of like turns an ugly diarrhea. <laughs> I was wondering, like mostly it looks brown, doesn't it usually? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was just like, uh, you know, but I am, you know, if people have the time to layer and they love that, they can do that. But so I didn't end up using the butterfly pea, pea flour and the coconut milk just didn't work um, the way that I wanted. But yeah. Anyway, sorry, I got excited because yep. I was just like, this is my drink now. It's just like with matcha, <laughs> lavender, almond, you know, with some ice. Super simple. I probably could make it a lot better than that. But this is just like for my personal use. So <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I am so far obsessed. Like I've been making it every day and it's just like, like I said, it goes back to the kind of like ritual yeah. And also intentional and you just feel it's like very ceremonial. I love, I love yeah. to like that. Yeah. Tea um, drinking especially is, you know? Yes. I don't know about you, but over here in California, something is going around and I have been having to drink hot tea and lemon and like everything just to ward wow. off. I know. I don't know what it is, but, 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 but yeah. I want to talk about some of the recipes in your book, I mean, there's just one in particular I really want to hit on just because it is very relevant with the new moon in Gemini coming up on yeah. June 6th. What's fun about your Moon Magic Mixology book is your cocktails, you can kind of look and see what moon it goes best with. Yeah. So this is your Gemini one. It's called The Lunar State of Mind with Energies of Communication, the Mind Purification. I think this is really big because it's Gemini season now. Um, And it says the moon in Gemini is the perfect occasion to work on how you express yourself and project your thoughts into the world. And this minty blue beverage is a delicious way to open up your throat. I feel like I need that and clear your mind in order to do just that. Serve at your next gathering to entice open communication or to practice speaking up for yourself or sip alone under the Gemini moon to clear and purify your mind. And like this is just one example of yeah. the tens of dozens of cocktail recipes you have. And that's just in this book that doesn't include witchcraft <laughs> cocktail like or your next one. So um, I just want to give people a little preview of that because, yeah. again, with a lot of people moon manifesting and we're yes. really in tune with the moon phases, this is such a great book to have yeah. if you really want to make it magical. I don't even know if you have one off the top of your head, but do you have a favorite recipe that you're like, this is like my top? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if you saw, I had to like turn to the page in the book because I've just reached a point between my books, my blog (laughs) and just in collaborating. Cause I've done some recipe development for, um, you know, other people in other locations. And so like, I can't even get like, remember all the recipes off the top of my head. I will say about this one, like one thing I do want to preface about these recipes and especially because the moon, when you think of the moon's connection to water and connecting to it through a potion and, it, and when I do these recipes, they have specific correspondences of the ingredients, whether it's the energy 
energy of the ingredients, herbalistic properties, or its association in astrology. Um, so all those things come together. But also like when I create recipes, I like to make it in a way that people can modify because it's also like the best magic is the one that you actually fucking do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it's like, even if you're not drinking something super aligned, you know, as long as you're doing it, you know, whatever you can do. Right. Um, and so like, even in that recipe, we have the lemon balm ginger syrup. I love lemon balm for a lot of reasons. It is connected to the moon. Um, and it has like immune immunity benefits, but you know, you can just use fresh mint instead of, of lemon balm. Right. So just, mm-hmm. you can always like improvise things instead of following this to a T because our flavor preferences are as, you know, unique, um, from person to person. And so is our magic. Uh, oh my God, I forgot your question already. Oh, it was your favorite cocktail, but I totally understand if you don't have one because you're right. You do have a million recipes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like going back to like witchcraft cocktails. I definitely don't have, I will say I really love the moon mezcalita. And I think that's the one that has like a cantaloupe um, or melon in there. Oh my God. So good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's part of the thing is like, I like to make really unique things, but also like what's going to be accessible and approachable for most people. Virgo moon mojito would also be good for, you know, Gemini season just because uh, Virgo and Gemini share share rulership of being ruled by Mercury. So there's some correspondences there. But yeah, especially for Gemini season, you know, like it's just this uh, creative flush, but also like sometimes you need to balance that out and like, you know, that the clarity and the clear thinking and working on your mindset and communication and opening up that throat um, and connecting to the element of air. So yeah, that's actually, I'm really glad you pointed out that one. I was looking at it and I was like, oh, you know, I hope when she talks about Gemini season, that's one that she mentions, but yeah. It's, I'm excited to try it. I mean, once I clear up whatever is going on. Yeah which like may or may not be strep throat. Oh my God, Um, I hope not. Then we will, we will try some cocktails. (laughs) But until then, it's going to be hot tea and lemon for me. Julia, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I just really appreciate you taking the time to sit down, tell us about yourself, your background, your process and writing, and like also just go over some of your, your wealth, honestly, of knowledge in magic and history and like everything and mixology. So it's, it's been amazing. How can listeners connect with you on social media and where can they find your books to buy? Yeah. Um, luckily my publisher, Adams Media, they're owned by Simon Schuster, <laughs> like everything else is this day. So <laughs> you can like online anywhere, but especially if you want to support local shops um, and also help support authors going to your local metaphysical shop, you can specifically request books and they'll order it for you. And that's a great way to like support the author and support the shop. And yeah, just connecting me through my website, juliahelinahattis.com. But where I'm most active is witchcraftcocktails.com. And it has links to all the socials because I have my social media witchcraft cocktail um, on Instagram. They're all different on every site. Um, so the best way is just to go to the website and then click through to the social media. But I regularly share recipes and, and information and all that. And sorry for the ADHD tangents and going oh off. On... <laughs> it's fun. I, like, I, I like it because it like helps me like keep up, you know, it gets me yeah. excited. I don't know. I don't know why that is, but I don't, I don't know if I told you this. Let me tell you this before you go. Yeah. You know how I found you? No. Hillary Burton. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, how my, crazy wait. is that? She posted. I, it was either one of your cocktails or it was your book or something. Yeah. And I was like, I follow her on Instagram and I was like, who is this? And I stalked all your socials and I was like, oh my God, I need to have her on my podcast. And I reached out. I love it. Yeah. Cause um, sometimes, you know, I love that because um, Hillary Burton, like she's just so amazing. And yeah. I saw she had this book coming out. We were connected on social media. So, and she also has her MF libations brand. And I don't know if you've tried the Blackberry Gin, but it's like, honestly, it surpassed a lot of my expectations. It is stronger at 50% alcohol. So that's wow. the only thing. But yeah, I was like, hey, like I saw you have your book coming out and you have your alcohol, you know, your brand. I would, I'd love to put together a drink for you. And so, uh, yeah. And I got an early copy of the book um, or like before it came out, you know, beautiful book. She's an amazing person. And I loved the experience of putting together a recipe that corresponded to these tidbits of things throughout the story. But yeah, 
So that's, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, because yeah. that was an amazing, like, moment for me. Honestly, like, a dream come true. I won't, like, lie. I was like, I can't believe this is real. And so, um, yeah. That's yeah. really cool. I mean, and if you don't, if you're listening and you don't know who Hilly Burton is, oh my God, <laughs> like what? But she uh, plays Peyton on One Tree Hill. So I always am trying to look for people to interview for this podcast. Kind of like you said, I know that spirituality really boomed in the pandemic, but it's yeah. hard to find more like authentic people who are really in the space and stuff. So I'm happy that we were able to connect. Yeah. And yeah, this was amazing. And thank you so much for sharing these with me uh these yeah. books i appreciate it thank you i want to say thank you again to julia for being on the asher candy podcast what a fun conversation right her story is amazing and just so inspiring i love that she was able to kind of like follow her passions and it led to her basically doing all of them at once She's such a sweetheart, too, and her cocktail recipes are phenomenal. I've linked in the show notes, you know, how you can connect with Julia and also get one of her books. I cannot wait till once I'm fully recovered from strep throat to have one of her cocktails. Like, I'm going to probably do the New Moon and Gemini cocktail coming up on the 6th. But, like, there's way more than that, like we discussed, so... Anyway, I know what I'm doing this summer. She actually has a whole section of both of the books that I have uh, where it's like, these are the best summer cocktails. So you're going to be having a great time. Let me tell you with with your friends. That is one party trick that will be pretty cool. Like, oh, hey, I infused this drink with the magic of the moon. Again, thank you to Julia. Thank you for listening. This is, like I said, the last episode regular episode of Astro Candy before our summer hiatus. So we will be pretty much dark uh, between now and September. Beginning of September will be us back on schedule. But yeah, you can still keep up with us with the newsletter and the social club and the website and the Instagram and it's all linked in the show notes. All right, I will see you. Oh, I almost said next week. I will see you next month for cancer season. Bye. Bye.